Hey, Steve Mignani here doing the Junkyard Crawl in a private automotive collection in New England. Uh, brought to you by High Octane Classics in Auburn, Massachusetts. But again, what we have right here is something very special. This is a first year 1976 Dodge Aspen. Uh, this and its Plymouth Volare cousin were Chrysler's bid to downsize in the 70s, looking forward to the 1980s uh, as a response to the cafe thing, the OPEC oil crisis. And again, this was a replacement for the Plymouth Valiant and the Dodge Dart. They were sold side by side for a couple years, but again, from 1976 to 1980, the Aspen and Volare twins were Chrysler's midsize offering. Now, here is a Dodge catalog right here. We can see sort of right in the middle where your eye catch it, there's the new Aspen. Of course, it was sold next to the Monaco, the Charger, the Coronet, and of course the Dodge Dart. But the Aspen was the big news for 1976. And the big thing about the uh, Aspen was the fact that it could be had as a two-door or a four-door. But here's the thing, the two-door coupes like that one were built on a 108-inch wheelbase. The four-doors were on a 112-inch wheelbase. Now this catalog is kind of cool because it shows you the various options on the top right. That's the Aspen RT. Believe it or not, Dodge brought back the RT nameplate after hibernating since 1971 and put it onto the Aspen. Now the best, biggest motor you can get in these things would have been a 364 barrel with a 318 two barrel. No slant sixes in the Aspen, R or the Aspen RT, but check this out. This shot here shows, look at that, a floor shift, but that's the four speed overdrive. The muscle a833 four speeds were over and out by 1976. Again, the world was a different place. And here on the back, we can see the nice color shot of all the, the nifty groovy cars. But on the left-hand side, there they are, the Aspens, all different versions, wagons, four doors, two doors, darts, Monaco's, etc. But again, first year for Aspen, and there was a total of 189,900 of these things built, of which 61,917 were two-door coupes like this one. Now, as we uh, trade places, uh, we'll take a peek inside this. Now, you can see somebody sliced away the door hinge or the handle for some unknown reason, but inside the door, that crash beam right there is pretty heavy stuff. That is a federally mandated side impact protection item. And, I'm, and you can bet that Dodge did not want to add these things. This is probably about 20 pounds of dead weight, but it'll keep you from becoming dead if you get into a side impact. Inside, this is a base car. You can see on the seat, that's the aluminum bell housing for the three-speed manual transmission. The shifter on the column on this one, in fact, the transmission itself is on the front seat. There it is, the A230 three-speed manual. New for 1970, a fairly rugged three-speed, but you could actually get the four-speed overdrive for 127 bucks. Or if you were sporty type, for $28, you could get the shifter moved from the column down to the floor. And three-speed manual equipped Aspens and Malaris now are pretty rare, but back in the day, they were popular with budget conscious people. Now, as we close the door on this one, we'll see here the dreaded word catalyst right there. Now, every single one of these cars was built with a single catalytic converter, uh, and that was all about cleaner emissions, but unleaded gasoline. So if we go to the rear quarter panel, there's the gas filler right here. And the word unleaded gasoline only, which is a federal mandate as we get into the mid 70s. And inside here, uh, if I can open this. Yeah, there's going to be a little, uh, is that a locker? Yeah, it's a locking one. But anyway, there's a little flange inside of that, which prevents you from admitting leaded gas, which actually came from a nozzle that was larger. So these were uh, not idiot proof, but uh, basically lead proof. In the trunk, which was fairly commodious, as they say, pretty big trunk lid, lots of room in the back. Now, the thing of it is, because of that single catalytic converter, Chrysler elected to offset the gas tank over to the driver's side of the car, which means dual exhaust systems were strictly forbidden. These cars will not accept dual exhaust systems, even on the Coronet R or the Aspen RT uh, or the Plymouth Roadrunner. They all have a single exhaust that comes out the passenger side. So again, uh, when these cars were designed, Chrysler Corporation had no thought of muscle versions of these things. It's a wonder they even made the Aspen RT or over at Plymouth, kind of cool right here. This here is the MPC Volare Roadrunner. And frankly, this is kind of from the days of sticker supercars when plastic deck lid spoilers, plastic fender flares and decals made up for real power. Now this could be had with a 364 barrel at the very best, but no four speeds with the 360s, unfortunately. But here's that beautiful Volare right here. But here's the thing, 1976 Volare was the basis for the Roadrunner. Well, don't tell the people at MPC 
who kind of screwed up. This is the 1976 Roadrunner kit from MPC, right? Well, that's not a Roadrunner, that's a Plymouth Fury. This is a never was blooper of a model kit. The 76 Roadrunner would have been an Asp or a Valari. So again, kind of an MPC blooper. Even more than that, 1976, the Carter administration was coming into power and they were really against advertising alcohol to kids. Well, check this out. These are Michelob <laughs> stickers right there on the side of this thing, the six pack, which of course is a reference to the 446 pack engine that was theoretically optional in this model kit. Of course, there were no 440s in 1976 and no Roadrunner Furies in 76. 75 was last year. So it's kind of an odd thing right here that MPC should get it so right and so wrong at the same time. Well, let's continue our little walk around this puppy. I think that'll love the original paint and the Aspen, the Dodge Aspen logo right there. The thing of it is the Plymouth Valari was 98% the same car with just different emblems, slightly different taillights. And uh, you know, pretty much this was the beginning of when Dodge and Plymouth were pretty much indistinguishable. The K car would arrive in 1981 and put these things to bed. But um, again, this is uh, an example of the first year for the F body. Now something that made the F body really unique is under the hood. It's over the truck. There we go. I don't want this to fall down. Okay, one thing about the F body is that these still had torsion bar front suspension, but they were transverse. These two things right here are kind of shaped like hockey sticks. One of them goes this way. It's like an L, same thing with that, right and left. These things basically do the same thing that the old torsion bars did, but instead of being under the floor longitudinally, they're actually transverse at the front of the car. Here's the upper control arm right here and we can see the inner frame. These are unit construction, but again, uh, it's very telling that this uh, is the first year for the F body. And again, this would have been a slant six car. And sure enough, because of the federal bumper standards, which required telescoping bumpers, here's that shock absorber right here. There's a, an oil filled chamber right there. And theoretically, this one's probably all crusted up, but if this thing got tapped at five miles an hour, within 24 hours, it would have rebounded uh, and healed itself, so to speak. But this is, uh, again, first year for the mighty Dodge Aspen, the F body. Uh, again, these succumbed to rust. These were horrible when it came to rust. In fact, there was major recalls on these things due to rust. And Lee Iacocca, who was uh, just joining Chrysler Corporation in 1978, a couple years along, he said these were some of the, the worst warranty problem cars in Chrysler Corporation's history with the, with the rust. And of course, Lee Iacocca is the one who got the $1.4 billion uh, federal bailout for Chrysler Corporation, which they repaid with, with interest uh, within about five or six years. So Lee Iacocca kind of saved Chrysler. These cars were meant to save Chrysler, but they were really not the right cars for the time. The fact is, in the late 70s, early 80s, the front wheel drive K cars outsold these things by huge numbers because fuel economy was where it was at. So that's the story of the first year F car. Do we give it an F for fail? I don't think so. I kind of like these cars. I think they're coming on strong. I'll take an Aspen RT any day, make it an E58, 350, or 364 barrel, and I'll smile all day long. But uh, come back tomorrow for more Junkyard Crawl, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell so you're notified of new videos which come out every single day.